Here we go. Welcome everyone. My name is Joshua Wiest. Um, I hope this presentation is going to have information that will reach and entertain all of you. Uh, just a quick forewarning. Uh, there's some jokes in here that are some pretty deep cuts. So if you don't get them, it's probably because you have a social life, unlike me. Um, if Logan ends up laughing behind a screen, uh, maybe you can just give me a social chuckle or something like that. I'm going to try to keep this relatively lighthearted as it's a really dense topic and some of the these things are pretty uh, pretty intense. So let's get started. Um, I just want to thank everybody for signing up and listening to me butcher the Italian language for 90 minutes. Uh, hopefully this will be an informative and rewarding experience for everyone. This is the dynamic history of Bolognese fencing. Damn it, Rob. <laughs> Well, friends, thanks for my coming to my lecture. I hope that <laughs> you guys had a war <laughs> an informative and rewarding experience. Uh, be sure to leave a glowing review. It's been a pleasure. Just kidding. Let's get started for real. Uh, what is Bolognese fencing? And more importantly, who was it meant for? And what context was it used in? The Bolognese authors there are six known Bolognese authors that we generally link together on account of a shared vernacular or common fencing language. Then we have one person who is mentioned as being a master of one of the authors, and one we like to loop in because he taught fencing in the city of Bologna. They are Filippo Bartolome Bartolomeo Dardi, uh, Guido Antonio De Luca, Giovanni Filotillo Achiellini, Antonio Manciolino, Achille Marozzo, Angelo Vigiani, and Giovanni Dallagocchi, and then some guy in Italy, we think. The objective of this lecture is to discuss notable figures who were Bolognese in origin that we know taught or wrote about fencing and cor correlate their authorship or activity with the historical narrative we're about to discuss, mainly their ties to the ruling Bentivoglio family and the prevailing factionalism in Bologna. It's fun. All right, so before we go any further, I need to define Bolognese civics. With an idea of how the Bolognese government worked, it's going to be difficult to un understand how the lead families in Bologna became oligarchs and then eventually tyrants and despots. First, we have the position, the position, the signore, or the leading family in the city. Sometimes this just meant the family that had all the political sway, and sometimes this meant the family that defined politics, the apple in every ambitious family's eye. Next up, we have the Sedici, the 16, at first comprised of 12 members with leading figures from seven banking families, three jurists from the Lawyers Guild, and two citizens who were experienced in politics, all serving a one-year term. This is eventually increased to 16, and the term increased to a lifetime appointment, and then eventually formed back to one-year terms. Put a feather in that one. After that, we have the Anziani, literally the Council of Elders. This was made up of members of the lesser guilds and citizens from the general population. Most of the members of the Anziani were involved in the university in some way. The Gonfalonieri de Popolo was the title that was given to the leader of the Anziani, then would later take on a new connotation under papal rule as a civic leader under the papal legate. Last, we have the notable guilds. There was a hierarchy of guilds in Bologna, and participation in a guild would afford you a higher social status. The preeminent guilds were considered first-class citizens. So let's discuss that social hierarchy. The highest class of Bolognese citizen was made up of knights and doctors. The nobles were those who were citizens and within a third generation had a knight or a doctor in the family in the last 30 years and who did not pursue a manual craft or trade, or if they did, belonged to one of the four higher ranking guilds, that is like the note. Those guilds were the notable guilds or the noble guilds. Being a member of these guilds was the only way to advance to the highest rungs of society from a place of general citizenship. They were the note or the lawyers, the cambiatori, the bankers, the drapieri, the cloth merchants, or the artesirica, the silk merchants. After them were the superior guilds and the lesser guilds or vulgar guilds, which we'll cover in a moment. Before we do that, let's look at some of the leading families in the city. We have the Bentivoglio, the Popoli, the Malvezzi, the Merescati, the Achiellini, Canatoli, Fascarari, Gazzadini, Zembicari, Fantuzzi, Ghiselieri, Vezzani, and Rasponi. All of these families are going to be important to this story. 
the main families that we really need to focus on and that you really probably kind of keep in your mind whole would be the Bentivoglio, Papoli, Malvezzi, and Mariscotti. All these other characters are going to play key roles in this story, but those four families in particular are going to be paramount throughout the entirety of this story. So what we're going to see is over the course of about 100 years, there's going to be really only about 60 families that actually touch true power in Bologna. And out of that, you can see the beginnings of what ends up being an oligarchy and that notable families that had money, power, and influence coalesced all the power of the Bolognese government into themselves and created a small country club, if you will, that they dominated over. So let's dig into the other guilds, uh, the superior arts. They were the butchers, the apothecaries and spice merchants, wool workers, cloth merchants, my personal favorite, the haberdashers, cotton workers and goldsmiths. Anyone want to venture a guess as to what these guilds have in common? The answer is manual labor. So after our superior guilds come the vile crafts or the vulgar crafts. The sources I found often listed furriers. I guess the city of Bologna was the first PETA state. Uh, this category includes urban residents who aren't a part of the recognized guilds, but contribute to the city's economy. Then there's everyone else, prostitutes, anyone living outside the city, which is called the cantado, soldiers and foreigners. Note that there was actually a really large population of foreigners living in the city of Bologna, attending the university. The Spanish crown had its own wing of the university that was used for educating uh, state officials like diplomats, spies, and ambassadors. The three main foreign contingents were Spanish, German, and English. The structure of the Bolognese government might seem relatively sophisticated and borderline representative, and much of that can be attributed to the influence of the university, but it had its flaws. Once Bologna was granted independence in 1376 and Nicholas V granted them the right of self-governance in 1397 with the formation of the Sedici, Bologna became rife with factional infighting. The powerful families used the new branch of government, the Sedici, as a tool to cons consolidate power for only a select number of families. This trend would continue until the Sedici even replaced their courts as the vehicle for jurisprudence in the city. This is a summary list of all the conflicts that arose between 1397 and 1506. We're gonna focus on this period between 1398 and 1521. Notice any trends? That's right, the Bentivoglio. Over the course of a 68 year period, we're gonna see 19 regime changes. That's the equivalent of a new government every 3.57 years, which it doesn't sound too bad, given that here in the United States, we have an election every four years, Except when you factor in that every single one of these regime changes came at the behest of a bloody factional violence. So let's take a look at factions in Bologna. These are some of the factions that formed over the course of roughly 150 years. At times, families interchanged predominance within a faction or just outright jump between factions entirely. Guelph or Skibbeline. Note that this sense of factionalism never left the Italian consciousness. You might have heard about it in school at some point, them talking about Guelph versus Ghibelline when you were learning medieval history, but it extends well into the Renaissance and even into the modern age. As a matter of fact, Vigiani uses this language throughout his Lo Schermo, where he refers to people as either Guelph or Ghibelline as a qualifier to who they are within the city of Bologna. The Lambertazzi and the Germe. Scarsese vs. Traversi, Responti vs. Maltraversi, Bentivoleschi vs. Kineschi, Bentivoleschi vs. Malvezzani, Malvezziani. It was the roles of the leading families to coalesce as many of the other families as they could within the faction to gain role as Signoria. This is the force that tempered the Sega of the Bentivoglio, and this is the fertile field that gave life to the Bolognese system of fencing. It all starts in the 1370s when Salvuzzo Bentivoglio and his responding compatriots tried to, take, tried to take control of the Bolognese government. 
They get exiled, and then when Zalvuzzo is allowed to return from exile, he dies fighting on behalf of Niccolo III d'Este, who you may recognize if you're familiar with this guy named Fiore de Libre. Zalvuzzo Bentivoglio's younger brother, Giovanni, would carry his brother's, Zalvuzzo's, Responti legacy back into the Anziani in 1397, not long after his enshrinement into the Bolognese government. Giovanni II, who, along with Nani Gazzadini, would lead a revolt against Carlo Zambicari and his controversy allies. This failed and they were exiled, but Carlo caught the plague. Can I get a quattro cento, amen? And Giovanni and Nani were welcomed back into the city when Gaspare Scapi was able to quell the Montreversi government and provide them a safe return. Giovanni and Nani decided to share power in Bologna. To do this, they set up the Sedici, the Council of Sixteen, and had it blessed by the Pope. Both tried to use the Sedici to wrest control from the other. Thus, this arrangement wouldn't last very long. Oh, Nani got the Bolognese government to support his buddy, Abrico de Barbiano, and his attack on Faenza, Bolognese. Bologna's neighbor, and a blood feud with Astori Manfredi. This was the last straw for Giovanni, who rallied the families of the Scarsese and Maltraversi factions, called on his ancestral allies, the Butchers, and recalled the exiles of the Zembicari faction, concentrating his power for a mighty coup. Oh, hey, Fiore. We sure weren't, did we, gang? This lecture is about the history of Bolognese fencing, though. You're not supposed to be here, right? Speak of the devil, I guess. Moving on. Ah, that's why. Sneaky Fiore. It's his famed student, Lancelotto Bicaria. You see, when Giovanni Bentivoglio recalled the Zambicari, he earned the good graces of Gian Galeazzo Visconti, who, in sport of Giovanni's coup, provided him with two condottieri and a complement of men-at-arms. Those two condottieri were Martino Polsort and Lancelotto Picaria. Picaria and Polsort helped Giovanni corner the Gazzadini and the Palazzo Maggiore. Then they repelled a desperate sortie from Gazzadino Gazzadini, creative name. And once that was settled, they were able to arrest Nane and Baldassare Gazzadini. However, our dear friend Giovanni was a kind soul, a gracious man, a unifier. He thought it was best to make peace with his enemies and settled an agreement and let the Gazzadini family back into Bologna. The Gazzadini played nice at first, but when Giovanni betrayed the Visconti and allied himself with Florence, Gazzadini fled to Venice where he met with Gian Galeazzo Visconti and implored him to unseat Bentavoglio. Alberico de Barbiano got his chance to ravage Bologna at last, together with Ottobono Terzi, literally good eights. He storms across the Reno and started capturing fortresses from San Giovanni and Prochetto to Messina. He's joined at his fortress of Barbiano and Lugo by all the enemies of the Bentivoglio and the exiles from Bologna, including Nane Gazzadini and his brother Bonifacio, who ride together with, former, with further contingents of the Visconti army. Giovanni Bentivoglio was biding his time while he waited for the arrival of his Florentine allies under Muzio Attendolo Sforza. Upon their arrival, however, the people rose up in the city, and Giovanni had to violently put down the revolt. The Barbia tried to take advantage and approached the city in February of 1402 and attacked a supply column, which gave Giovanni his chance. He reacted quickly and unleashed Lancelotto, Pecharia, and Muzio Attendolo Sforza. They captured a thousand men, including Alberto Pio, Gerardo Rangone, Guido's great-great-granddaddy, and Marco de Pisa. The Barbiano falls ill and lets his guard down, which then allowed the Bolognese and Florentine contingent to overrun his camp and back all the territory that he had conquered. Barbiano and Gazzadini stayed in theater to seed revolts, popular uprisings in Bologna, but none of them amounted to anything. However, in spite of this recent success for Giovanni and the Bolognese, Gian Galeazzo Visconti's main army under Francesco Gonzaga, Pandolfo Malatesta, and Ficino Cane, the dog, arrived in theater to join Nani Gazzadini and Alberico de Barbiano near Castellecchio de Ruino. Giovanni Bentavoglio believed that he needed to win a daring victory to reclaim the wavering commitment of the Bolognese citizens. So he rode out of the sea with his army, and challenged the Visconti army to battle. This battle is insane. On 26 June, the Visconti forces attacked Giovanni Bentivoglio's encamped position. 
the first wave led by Jacopo, Jacopo del Verme and Galeazzo de Mantova, another of Fiore's famed students, attacked. Lancelotto Bittaria's company clashed with that of Ottobono Terzi, where Lancelotto was unhorsed and captured. The Barbiano's forces slammed into the Rose Company, led by Tomasino Crivelli, holding the Bolognese flank and put them to flight, while Muzio Attendolo Sforza squared off with Gazzadine Gonzaga in the middle of the, uh, with 2,000 knights. Sforza's men hold strong despite the flight of the Rose Company. He's able to press in close to a group of Bolognese exiles fighting under Gonzaga. Sport drives a lance through a man beside Nane Gazzadini, but then gets rammed by the mount of Ficino Cane and is thrown from his horse. Ficino Cane then is himself unhorsed, but manages to rip Puzzolino Tedesco from the saddle and captures him. After the initial onslaught, the Bolognese army is forced to retreat back into the city. That same night, when the victorious Milanese with 2,000 prisoners on their hands were advancing in the city, reads Addy. The bell rang out and the people assembled in arms on the Palazzo Commune, shouting, Viva la Popolo! I muro Giovanni! Long live the people and death to Giovanni. The fallen leader fought like a lion, having two horses killed under him and accounting for eight men with his own hands before he was taken. In fact, when Giovanni realized he couldn't hold off his own people and the Visconti any longer, having been betrayed by one of his closest allies, a butcher by the name of Lando di Ambrogino, who opened the gate and let the Visconti forces in. Giovanni locked himself in the Palazzo del Note, then escaped disguised as a refugee. He was discovered outside the city in a small house near the bridge of San Antonio on the Oposa, where his old nurse had lived. He was dragged into custody and forced to ask Barbiano and Gazzadini for forgiveness. Gazzadini took pity on him and gave him a private cell away from the angry crowds beginning to mob the palazzo, baying for blood. Alberico de Barbiano wasn't so inclined, however, and he threw Giovanni back into the street a few nights later and incited the crowd to show him the totality of Bolognese justice. Giovanni's body was torn to pieces, and Alberico Barbiano took one of his ears as a souvenir. After the mayhem subsided, the priests of the church gathered what pieces they could find of Giovanni's body strewn throughout the city and put him in a tomb in the church of San Giacomo. Who's your daddy? Darty dancing. All right, so we got to clear something up about Filippo Darty. You've probably heard this before. Maybe you haven't. There's a case of mistaken identity that's been plaguing academia yeah? and in the modern age, the HEMA world for some time. That is the presence of Filippo Dardi and Lipo Dardi and the registries of the city. The thing, the thing is, this wasn't really this. The thing is, this was cleared up hundreds of years ago by the university's register when they had a team of scholars put together a compendium of the university's famous professors. Stefano Mazzetti threw considerable doubt on the earlier scholarship on a man named Aladosi and said that his estimation that the two were one and the same and that Darty was Spanish was unequivocally false. So there you go. But let's talk about the life of Filippo Bartolomeo Darty. So in 1414, we know that Darty started a school for fencing in Bologna, supposedly. It's hard to confirm this because of a conflagration of source material. Then in 1534, he finishes a treatise on fencing, which is now lost. In 1443, he started receiving an annual stipend from the city of Bologna for 150 lira for teaching fencing in the city's youth in exchange for lowering his rates. This was more than the annual salary of a college professor at the time, and even a, the, annual college, uh, the annual salary of a college professor in the 16th century. And then in, 15, in 1464, he died. So how does this fit the historical narrative? We're gonna focus on the first set of dates here, 1414 to 1434. Major life events took place for Filippo Bartolomeo Dardi in those years. And while we can't directly link him to the Bentivoglio family without further evidence, let's see what transpires during these two years and see if we can draw a connection. Anton Galeazzo Bentivoglio. Anton Galeazzo Bentivoglio was 11 years old when his father was brutally dismembered by a mob of angry Bolognese citizens. It was by the grace of his innocence that he was permitted to stay in the city of Bologna. 
the mechanisms of government in the wake of his father's coup and the collapse of the Visconti hegemony were in the hands of a brutal papal legate named Baldassare Cosa. The remnants of the Bentivoglio family took a measured approach in these years, abiding by the will of the legate and focusing on the refinement of Anton Galeazzo's education. He was, by all accounts, as exceptional as his father, intelligent, charming, and keenly aware of the plot it's necessary to succeed in his position. In 1412, a group of wool merchants and butchers started a riot in the city, raging against papal authoritarianism. Anton Galeazzo, then 22 years old and in the middle of his law studies at the University of Bologna, was chosen by Baldassare Cosa to negotiate a peaceful resolution with his ancestral brethren. As a result of his successful negotiations, the legate awarded Anton Galeazzo with a share of the annual tax on moneylenders in the city. Anton Galeazzo didn't let this renewed status interfere with his studies, however. In 1414, he completed his doctorate law at the University of Bologna. As a result of his academic excellence and his inherent sprezzatura, the legate wrote to the Pope John XXIII and begged him to take Anton Galeazzo with him as a jurist and his retinue to the Council of Constance. There was a rising sense of liberal emotion swelling in the partition classes in Bologna at the time. As such, John XXIII acquiesced to his legate's request and left for the meeting with two Bolognese noblemen by his side two troublemakers, Anton Galeazzo Bentivoglio and Battista Cantoli. John XXIII had something else in mind for the young starts, however. Sensing the failure of the attempted ecclesiastical reconciliation that was attempted at Constance, John XXIII released Anton Galeazzo and Battista, and they rushed back to Bologna in his name. They rallied support to their banners and sent a letter requesting the assistance of Braccio de Montone. Then on the 6th of January, 1416, expelled all the papal officials from Bologna and reinstated the Sedici. On the 16th of January, 1416, Anton Galeazzo was elected to the Council of 16, the Sedici. In 1418, he was re-elected and was given the honor of becoming a lecturer at the, the University of Bologna. Yeah. It was about this time that two star-crossed lovers, torn between rival families with a history of political violence, met under the stars and made a baby. Yes, that's right. Our friend Anton Galeazzo fell madly in love with the daughter of the man who was responsible for the capture and brutal murder of his father, Nane Gazzadini. There's a, there's a twist to this Shakespearean romance, however, because it wasn't just Anton Galeazzo who took a bite from the apple of the Gazzadini heirs. It was also his best friend, Gaspari Malvezzi. In 1420, Francesca gave birth to a little boy and named him Annabale. Both Gaspari and Anton Galeazzo wanted to claim little Hannibal as their own and to marry Francesca. So they decided to do what any reasonable person would do in such an, a situation. They played a game of dice to settle the little tyke's legacy. Anton Galeazzo won. Anton Galeazzo didn't leave his buddy Gaspari Malvezzi out to dry. However, he offered him a concession and united the their family by having him wed his sister, Giovanna Bentavoglio, seen to the left. About this time in 1420, coordination between the Kaneski Ken Ken and Bentavoleski broke down. Anton Galeazzo rallied his supporters and occupied the Palazzo del Comune. The Kaneski met them in the Palazzo, shouting, Long live the people in the guilds! A desperate fight ensued. Giovanna Bentolio Malvezzi, in support of her brother and husband, went door to door, palazzo to palazzo, according to Della Tuata, imploring the gentilamini, cavalieri, and docturi of the city to champion her brother's cause, taking their weapons and putting them in their hands, demanding that they fight. Della Tuata mentions that she put a sword in his father's hand and implored him to fight, despite the fact he had never stained his hands with blood. Anton Galeazzo was victorious. While Boniface the Knight had Ninth had made concessions to the right of Bolognese self-governance governance in the wake of Giovanni's coup. The new Pope Martin V believed the city to be immediately subject to the Holy See. Giovanni's coup was his cue. Nicholas put the city under an act and dispatched his loyal Guelph captain, Braccio del Montone, to restore papal authority. Montone, because of his love on, of Anton Galeazzo, gave the Bentavoglio a choice, abdicate or face the consequences. Anton Galeazzo acquiesced. 
Anton Galeazzo was given Castel Bolognese as a concession and given the re title of Rector Temporalibus of Campania and Maritima. However, Giovanni sensed the trap, taking the position would have been a downgrade in status. He would have been a lord of the cantato, which would have made him a rural lord and therefore no longer a part or even eligible for the Anziani or the Sedici. So he couldn't f practice within the Bolognese government. And so he refused the appointment by attending his new appointments, by, by not attending his appointments, uh, uh, forcing Martin V to revoke his titles on 28th of November, 1520. The new legate assumed control of the city, and with him came the exiled Canatoli, who repositioned themselves as the preeminent family in Bologna. This made Castel Bolognese the rallying point for all the political exiles and opponents of papal authority. Suspicious of Bentivoglio's influence in this time, the legate demanded that Anton Galeazzo revoke his holdings, and being of a most kind and <laughs> Being of a most kindly and reasonable disposition, Anton Galeazzo agreed for a tidy sum, naturally. So what do you do? You just lost all your holdings. You just got kicked out of your city. Any reasonable person decides that they're just going to become a condottieri. So you just go off and become a mercenary. In the spring of 1423, Anton Galeazzo was approached by Ronaldo Diabizzi. Um, and after his brief stay, he announced uh, his brief stay at uh, Castel Bolognese. He announced that Anton Galeazzo was now in the service of Florence. Florence attacked Luca, which provoked the wrath of the Visconti and started this forever war. Uh, an interesting note here is that Anton Galeazzo presumably joined the company of Micheletto Attendolo, which may have been called the Brotherhood of Arms, the Fratellanza di Arme, and Marazzo's Learte dell'Arme may have been a callback to this legacy. The Battle of Zanganara in 1424 was a Fyrig victory for Milan. It's the biggest battle that Anton Galeazzo would have taken a part of as, a, as the captain of fortune for the Florentines. Um, in this battle, Alberico II de Barbiano, the Barbiano's son, who is allied with Florence, so his forces were under siege in the castle of Zanganara by Angelo della Pergola. The Florentine army under Carlo and Pandolfo Malatesta, the badhead bros, tried to break the siege. The Florentines then tried to rout the local force of Secco de Montagna, but after hours of desperate fighting, the initial Florentine charge waned. Then the army of Angelo della Pergola lifted its siege and routed the Florentine army. The victory was fearic for Milan because the localization of Milanese forces at this time allowed the Venetians to capture Brescia and end all aims of Milanese domination in Florence. However, Anton Galeazzo's time in Florence wasn't all about weapons and warfare. It was also about love. A glimpse of his life there, according to Ghiardaki, is afforded by the store of a court which he paid to a lady living in Costa de San Giorgio. One evening he caused the payment before her house to be strewn with flowers and fruit while musicians played and peacocks and rabbits disported themselves for her pleasure. Quite the romantic. It's about this time that fortune turned for Anton Galeazzo. The Canatoli had overthrown the papal legate in Bologna. They had made themselves signoria, as all great families will. Meanwhile, the impression of Anton Galeazzo made on Cosimo de' Medici and Rinaldo di Abizzi, the two leading members of the leading families of Florence, gave him the political weight to work his way back into the good graces of the new Pope, Eugenius IV. Eugenius IV dispatched Jacopo Caldora and Micheletto Attendolo to remove the Canatoli from power and asked the condottieri to take Anton Galeazzo with him as the papal ambassador. After taking Taking most of the Cantado, the countryside territory of the city, they besieged the city proper for almost two years, making four major assaults and various attempts to sabotage the de defenses. This image here, this famous image that I'm sure you've seen of a condottiere, is a picture of Jacopo Caldora. They tried everything here attacking different gates, bribery, coercion, inciting a rebellion in the city. All the attempts failed, and with each new attempt, the Bolognese citizens had the perpetrators drawn, quartered, and hung from the ramparts for the viewing pleasure of Caldora's men. Finally, the city gate, the city agreed to a truce. 
Months after the truce, Canatoli and Zimbacari weren't done. They exiled the papists again, and the papal legate once again, relying on the help of the Visconti this time. Caldora moved to stop the rebellion, but was unable to quell the uprising. Eugenius IV superseded the rebellion, however, and negotiated separately with Filippo Maria de Visconti and had the Canatoli and Zimbacari exiled. This gave Anton Galeazzo the opportunity that he was waiting for. On December 4th, 1435, Anton Galeazzo was given permission to re-enter the city of Bologna. He arrived with a large company of his loyal compatriots, his own men, and found his home completely provisioned. Locals from across the city flocked to his palazzo in San Donato, bringing flour, wine, furniture, making sure that he had every need. The streets were teeming with Bolognese citizens, excited to see his triumphant return. Despite this return coming at the behest of Pope Eugenius, the person least excited to have a once exiled partition return to the ranks of un unruly Bolognese nobles who had just rebelled twice was the papal legate Daniele, Bishop of Concordia. The warm welcome and excitement of the people made him pretty anxious. To smooth over any existing animosity and put a good foot forward, Daniele invited Anton Galeazzo to meet him for mass then to accompany him to the Palazzo del Comune, where they would discuss the future. After giving Anton Galeazzo one final blessing, he ushered him to the staircase descending into the courtyard of the Palazzo. As they walked down the staircase, and then Anton Galeazzo stepped off the last square, the last stair, into the courtyard, he was grabbed by a group of armed men and beheaded on the spot. Filippo de la Torre wrote a telling epitaph. It seemed to the priests that he was too much loved. Whew. All right, let's take a deep breath. Okay, let's line this up with our darty narrative. In 1414, Anton, Anton Galeazzo Bentivoglio had completed his tenure at the University of Bologna and started organizing his political sphere, a coalition that the papal legate recognizes as potentially dangerous. This is the same year that Filippo Bartolomeo Dardi started teaching fencing in the city. Then in 1434, when Anton Galeazzo returned from his exile in period of captaincy as a condottiere, spending a long time in military service, where they would have been doing a lot of fencing, probably practicing with arms of various types, Darty reappears in the record and publishes a treatise on fencing. Where was Darty for 20 years? He could have been with Anton Galeazzo. Now let's examine the period of turmoil in the aftermath of Anton Galeazzo's death. The Pope made a personal visit to Bologna to quell the mistrust of his legate in 1436 and stayed in the city for two years, trying to reorganize the civic structure of the city. He inevitably removed Daniele, Bishop of Concordia, and replaced him with Baldassare di Ofida. De La Tuata remembers De La Fida, uh, Di Ofida as being most cruel and tyrannical. Di Ofida saw himself as a prince of the church and as such extorted large sums of money from the Bolognese partitions. This obviously would have made them very happy. In 1438, the Bentivoleschi in the city had had enough. Go figure. Raffaello Fascarari met in secret with Gerardo Rangoni of Modena, and they agreed to send a letter to Milan to Niccolo Piccionino. They wanted to reestablish a citizen government. On May 20th, 1438, they hatched their plan. The butchers of Bologna captured Stre San Donato and let Piccionino's men in through the gate. The papal legate and his men were easily overwhelmed and exhumed from the city. Raffaello Fascari assumed the role of Gonfaloniere di Giustizia. He wrote a letter declaring Bolognese liberty to all the cardinals and leaders of the church and recalled Annabale Bentavoglio to the city. Do you remember him? Annabale had been in Naples, continuing his career as a condottiere that he had started with his father in Florence, fighting under Micheletto Attendolo on behalf of Queen Joanna of Aragon against Rene of Anjou. Annabali was, stop me if you've heard this one before, valiant, handsome, prudent, and well-mannered, and of so charming a disposition that he drew all hearts to himself. Annabali's return was met with great enthusiasm. A great magnitude of Bolognese citizens met him at the gates and lined the streets for his triumphal reentry. 
When he arrived, he was recognized as first citizen of Bologna and given the title of Gonfaloniere of the Anziani. Ludovico Bentivoglio and Raffaello Fascarari set up a new ruling council, a balia, consisting of 10 leading citizens serving an indefinite term. There was some contention in that both Ludovico and Annabali were placed on this council, and that meant there were two Bentivoglio with supreme power. Fascarari in particular took exception to this agreement. Seeing Annabali as nothing more than a boy, a figurehead, and a mere soldier, he thought the title that he had given him of Gonfaloniere of the Anziani was sufficient as a symbolic leader of the city. Vascarari had ambitions of his own. He wanted to be named the Gonfaloniere de Justizia for life. So to control Annabale and increase his status, he tried to demand that Annabale marry his daughter. He also asked Niccolo Piccionino, who was still in the city, to keep Annabale as close as possible. Naturally, Annabale rejected both propositions, telling Foscarari that he didn't need any tutelage from Piccinino, and he would marry Danina Visconti instead. Foscarari threatened Annabale that he would send him back to grooming horses as a stir of fortune. On February 4th, 1440, Foscarari walked out of his house and started making his way to the Piazza del Commune. Suddenly, 15 men descended upon him and murdered him in the street. It was clear that Annabali was behind the murder, but rather than condemn him, the people celebrated. The city issued an official decree that Fascarari was trying to make himself a tyrant, insinuating that his murder was justified. In the wake of the murder in 1441, Annabali married Danina Visconti. For a time, it looked like Bentivoglio had quelled one of their greatest threats to independence by uniting the Bentivoglio and Visconti families. However, Milan was losing its war with Florence and Venice, and in the Peace of Cavriana in 1441, one of the stipulations agreed by the Visconti was aiding Eugenius IV and returning Bologna to power to the power of the church within two months. Niccolo Piccionino had taken up permanent residence in Bologna, acting as a governor and counselor for the transition of the Bolognese self-governance. He was at this time, however, still in the employ of Filippo Maria Visconti. And upon the treaty that was signed, he made a secret pact with the Pope. During this time, it became a custom that mercenary captains could never enter a city with their armies and that their men had to build it outside of city walls. So it wasn't that surprising that Niccolo's son, Francesco, brought his army into the Emilia region and camped in close proximity to the city. As the weather started to get cold, Francesco said that he was feeling ill and requested to come into the city to seek medical treatment. Annabella obliged, showing him the greatest hospitality. They had served together as condottieri. They were friends, and Annabali made it a point to greet him every morning and check on his condition. Francesco delighted in the visits and insisted that Annabali and his courtiers, Giovanni Ventusi, Romeo Papoli, Gaspari, and Achille Malvezzi, should join him for some fresh air in San Giovanni and Prosciutto. Naturally, they were delighted by the offer and rode out of the city together the next day. Upon reaching San Giovanni, the Bolognese nobles were pulled from their horses and placed under arrest. Annabali was sent to Castel Varno in Parma, while Gaspari and Achille Malvezzi were sent to the fortress of Campiano, and Romeo Pepoli and Giovanni Fantuzzi were suspiciously allowed to return to Bologna. While Annabali was in, well, with Annabali in prison, Niccolo Piccionino declared himself as Lord of Bologna in the name of the Pope, Eugenius IV, and garrisoned the case with the men from his own army. A year passed, and the Bentivoleschi tried their best to get by under the tyranny of Piccionino and Pope Eugenius IV. I think it was May 10th when Bologna was groaning under the yoke of Francesco Piccionino, wrote Galeazzo Merescati, when he was approached by a man named Genesio de Borgo Sandanino, who knew the Castellan of Castelvarno. The story goes that one day Genesio was visiting his friends the Castellan, and the Castellan decided to take a nap. So Genesio decided, hey, hey why not? I'm going to play a game of chess with Annabale Bentivoglio. Annabale had a simple request, that Genesio relay a message that he was in Varno Castle in chains and asked that they send help. Galeazzo acted quickly. He took two of his closest compatriots and tried to enter the castle and detected. Their attempt failed. Undeterred, Galeazzo started recruiting men for his second attempt. He convinced his brothers Tario and Genesio 
another Genasio, and two well-known Bentevaleschi cloth merchants, Giacomo Malvotti, Malavotti and Michele Tejano, to assist him. The fifth person to join his retinue was Gerardo Rangoni, friend of Annabali's father, Anton Galeazzo, and the grandfather of Guido Rangoni. Hidden in a chestnut wood under the cover of a storm, Galeazzo and his compatriots crept to the wall with a ladder they had pilfered from the local monastery and a makeshift rope that Galeazzo had fabricated from discarded cloths. Genesio was the first to try his luck and was successful in breaching the wall, which is insane when you look at this wall. He snuck down as to not disturb the guards and open the gate for everyone else. From there, they slowly worked their way to the Castellan's tower. But when they arrived, they found the door secured and couldn't pick the lock. So they were forced to wait until dawn. With the sun slowly creeping into the sky, they were awoken by the sounds of the Castellan calling to the watch warden to open the gates. When the warden exited his tower, Galeazzo leapt out at him and strangled the man until he was unconscious. They left the warden under the care of Michele de Lojano and made their way into the tower. While the others were climbing the stairs, the watch warden awoke and Michele was forced to drive his dagger under the man's chin. Yet undetected, Gaspari Genesio Grado Giacomo and Tadio found the Castellan in his bed, waiting to be attended by the warden. Gaspari Meriscotti burst in, sword in hand. The Castellan didn't even attempt to put up a fight and silently sat while Rangoni and Genesio bound his hands, his feet, and his mouth. Then from there, they hurried into the cells where they found Annabali, emaciated and in poor health. Gaspari picked him up, gathered him in a big embrace, and then helped the others release him from his fetters. The conspirators then raced through the tower and collected the rest of the guards and bound them, dragging them into the women's quarters where they, where they had moved the castellan and the dead watch warden. They removed all the bells from the bell towers and waited for nightfall. At the hour of Angelus, they took the hostages that... The, they took the hostages. Um, they told the hostages that if any of them had raised the alarm, a fate similar to the watchword and befall the Castellan, who they decided to take with them as the hostage. They escaped the castle with little incident, but when they reached the river Taro at Fornovo, the river was too swollen from the rains, and Annabale, in his weakened state, couldn't cross the river. They unbound the Castellan and set him free then took turns carrying Annabale on their backs as they battled the torrent of the river. Needing rest, they found a small village and convinced the locals that they were soldiers in Piccinino's army and needed a place to rest. The next day, they were able to procure horses and some provisions and made their way to Rangone's castle in Spelumberto. Galeazzo and his brothers returned to Bologna and spread word that Annabale was free. All the families rallied around the Bentivoglio banner, including the Canatoli, and stormed the Palazzo del Comune, shouting, Viva la Libertà! Nope. Piccinino's men barred the doors and started raining a hail of crossbow bolts down into the piazza. Galeazzo Merescati and Romeo Pepoli took their men into the nearby Palazzo del no de Note and Palazzo del Podesta and started returning fire. By this time, Annabale was back in the city, armed in his finest armor. Together with his supporters, they managed to breach the side door of the palazzo and poured inside, overpowering Piccinino's guards. The crowds erupted in a great cheer when Annabale presented Francesco Piccinino from one of the palazzo windows and started demanding that he cast him into the street. Annabale, however, refused, citing his friends still in captivity, the Malvezzi, fearing for their lives. In the wake of Annabali's return, he made an alliance with Cosimo de' Medici, guaranteeing Bologna's protection for five, five years. Then he made peace with Canatoli, and for the grace of their aid in overthrowing Piccinino out of Bologna, he recalled all of the family's exiles. Amidst this flurry of political machinations, there was a prompt response from the Visconti, who had a captain in Romagna named Luigi del Verme, just southwest of Bologna. He moved to Medicina and Cento, where he almost captured Ludovico Bentivoglio. But the elder patron was saved thanks to the efforts of Alberto Pio. Then Del Verme moved to take Manziolino, Pio Mazzo, and Castle Franco Emilia. Annabale rode out and joined a contingent of his Florentine and Venetian allies who responded to his call for aid. They managed to cut him off 
cut uh, Del Verme off at Castle San Giorgio di Piano on the morning of August 14th. The battle lasted the entire day. Del Verme, with 3,000 cavalry, was faced with an army of 7,000 mixed units under Annabale. Del Verme's captain, Paolo de Roma, is over, was overwhelmed by Annabale's initial charge and forced to flee, while a second squadron of Del Verme's ca cavalry, meant to flank the Bolognese troops, was stopped by Pietro Navarino. With his army and his battle plan crumbling before him, Del Verme charged headlong in, with his vanguard into the fray but his presence wasn't enough to rally his wavering troops. He ended up fighting one-on-one -on -one with Seminato de Castello San Pietro, but couldn't overcome him and was forced to flee the field. The Milanese forces were forced to negotiate a truce and exchange prisoners with the Bolognese. When Achille and Gaspari Malvezzi were, were released and they crossed the Reno River, they shouted in triumph, Sega, Sega, Sega! Peace prevailed in Bologna, but the tedium of the day-to-day -day governance rekindled old feuds. The Canatoli were jealous of the favor that Annabali gave to Gaspari Meriscati and the Meriscati family. They thought they would have received a similar position given their status and history as first family in Bologna. Annabali tried to quell this animosity by volunteering himself as the godfather and sponsor of Francesco. Gesellieri's newborn son, a member of the Canatoli faction. After the ceremony at the cathedral, accompanied by Francesco Gesellieri and Baldassare Canatoli, they made their way to the Canatoli Palazzo, where they were going to have an after party. The function did not last long, and as he left the church, Francesco Gesellieri delighted, took Annabale by the arm, and as they walked together, he said to him, Companion, let's go to the party. And they set off towards Gesellieri's house. When approaching them a few steps away, Baldassare Canatoli called Betoso, with armed men presented, who presented themselves to Annabale. The latter, in a flash, moved by instinctive feeling rather than by a formed judgment, drew his sword to defend himself. But the felon Francesco Gesellieri stood holding him tightly by the arm, grinning, and said to him, Companion, you must have patience. He hadn't said these words before the villain, but Tozo Canatoli plunged his stylus into his chest. Baldassari Canatoli pulled the dagger free and thrust it in Annabelle's chest two more times for good measure. The Canatoli fired a cannon to signal their assault on the Bentovaleschi. Gaspari Meriscati on the other side of the city was with his brothers, Tario and Genesio, two of the other heroes. They were ambushed and his brothers were killed but he was able to overcome the Kineski and raise the general alarm, the bell of San Giacomo and rally the Bentovaleschi. Together, Gaspari Meriscotti and Romeo Pipoli were able to reestablish order, and the people of Bologna marched through the streets, hunting Kineski, shouting, death to the traitor who slew our sweet Annabale. Quite the narrative, isn't it? Let's get back to Darty. By 1414, the Bentovaleschi faction is established in Bologna. 1434, Anton Galeazzo returns from his spell as a conductor, and Dardi publishes his fencing treatise. In 1443, when Annabali returns from his imprisonment and forms his new government with unlimited authority, Dardi is given his doctorate in arithmetic and given a license to teach at the university and a salary to teach fencing in the city, a position that Annabali alone could grant him. Remind you of that a position that Annabale Bentavoglio could alone grant him. I've never personally been a great believer of the idea that Darty is the father of Bolognese fencing. There's a much cleaner line between De Luca, and Darty always seemed like an outlier, but I have to admit, having applied research to a concise timeline of documented events in Darty's life, I'm firmly back in the Darty camp, even if it's purely speculation. So let's talk a little bit about butchers. The power of the pawn push. Let's recognize their role in all of this. People in power, oftentimes, tyrants and despots, will often weaponize law to give themselves an advantage over those whom they wish to oppress. Weapons laws at this time were relatively harsh, and they were changed to ensure that only butchers could carry knives in the city, while common man couldn't carry anything with a sharp point without a permit. For the Benvolio, this was manifest in their relationship with the butchers, the Arte de Becchi of Bologna. This familial alliance was first exercised in 1401 by Giovanni I Benvolio when they helped him catch, capture Nani Gazzadini. 
Later, they supported Anton Galeazzo Bentivoglio against the Kineski. And in 1438, opened the gates of Porta San Donato for Foscarari to help him bring Annabali back into the city. The butchers were incredibly important to this story. And you can see how they were able to weaponize their position that the Bentivoglio had given them and change laws to help them be this secret military force within the city. Quickly, before we move on, those of you who have seen Robin Hood Men in Tights, is that not a striking resemblance? My God. And that painting is from the 1500s. It's crazy. All right. Let's talk about the Bentivoglio hegemony. We're going to speed through the next 40 years of history, only hitting the highlights of civic violence. However, let me tell you, quickly tell you about the origin story of Santi Bentivoglio. In the wake of Annabali's murder, his youngest son, Giovanni II Bentivoglio, his only son, Giovanni II Bentivoglio, was only two years old. So Bologna was looking for some sort of a ruler. They ended up bringing in this kid named Santi Bentivoglio to represent the Bol and the Bentivoglio faction. Santi is an incredible story. He was the adopted son of a blacksmith who in no way could have imagined the fate that was in store for him. Santi's true parents were Ercole Bentivoglio, the brother of Anton Galeazzo, and a poor rural peasant girl who Ercole had fallen in love with. We don't know what happened to his mother, but he was raised, like I said, by a local blacksmith in Florence. He had no idea he was a Bentivoglio. He had no knowledge of his prior life. He ended up working as a wool merchant's apprentice in the city of Florence. And then one day, when he was 21 years old, he was surrounded by Cosimo de' Medici's guards. They snatched him from the life he knew, and he was taken to Cosimo's court, his palazzo, as a result of Annabelle his assassination, and then told that he was going to go to Bologna and he was going to become the ruler of Bologna. Absolutely insane. Santi's parentage and whereabouts were maintained and monitored by this man named Circola de Ascoli, the spy master of Anton Galeazzo and Annabali Bentivoglio. Then later, Santi and Giovanni II Bentivoglio. Upon young Santi's departure from the Signoria of Florence, Cosimo de' Medici actually sat him down and had this to say to the anxious young man. If you are a son of Ercole Bentivoglio, you will desire to go to Bologna and play the part that befits your noble birth. If you're the son of Agnolo de Casecchi, you will stay at his shop in San Martino and be content with small things. Santi, his initial ploy into government was relatively peaceful in that Florence had his back the entire time. He also made a very close relationship with the Sforza. And so having powerful allies outside of Bologna made Santi relatively untouchable because he had so much political weight behind him. However, he did face an attempt, um, an attempted return of the Canatoli in 1448. Uh, then as a result of how he and Galeazzo Merescati, who was basically acting as his, his um, sort of his uh, foster at this time, um, based on how they handled the situation, they found themselves at odds with Romeo Pipoli and Giovanni Fantuzzi. You might remember them because they're the two guys who surprisingly managed to go back to the city of Bologna when Annabali Vento and Achille Malvetti were both captured, right? Yeah, those, those guys. So they thought that Santi was trying to usurp judicial power from the city. The two faction leaders under the auspices of the plague, can I get a cinquecento, amen, left Bologna in the summer of 1449 and entrenched themselves in Castel San Pietro and the Cantado of Bologna. They wrote a letter to King Alfonso of Naples and all the Canatoli exiles. They formed a considerable cadre of discontent noble families consisting of the Canatoli, the Zembicari, Pepoli, Gisilieri, Fantuzzi, the Vazano, the Correggio, and all told gathered 3,000 men for an assault on the city. They bribed the captain of the gate of the Strada Maggiore and managed to penetrate the city, but the betrayal of one of their compatriots allowed Santi and Galeazzo to prepare themselves, and the Popoli Fantuzzi conspirators were defeated. All of the captured proponents of the conspiracy were executed in the main piazza, with a, sword, a set of forged keys hanging about their necks. 
Another attempt in 1454, enacted yet again by the Canatoli, was snuffed out. Battista Menzoli, a law professor at the university, had been funneling weapons into the city for a coup, but the plot was discovered and Menzoli was arrested. A loyal Bentevaleschi, Paolo della Volta, took justice into his own hands and murdered Manzoli in his prison cell. Santi, along with Annabelle's son, Giovanni II, both helped to stabilize and centralize Bolognese authority around the Bentefolia family. Despite the early misgivings, while Santi played a role of passenger in a grander political machinations of Cosimo de' Medici, Giovanni the second upon Santi's passing became an active player and recognized authority in northern Italy, both as a ruler of Bologna and as a condottieri. The outward political focus and slow dissolution of papal influence was in large part thanks to alliances with Sforza and Milan and the Medici and Florence at the height of their power. This gave Giovanni in particular an air of supreme authority. Giovanni, as a mercenary captain, actually had a really kind of fascinating career. Um, he managed to stave off two big coups, one that was attempting to overthrow the Tieste family in Ferrara, which then brought those two families together. And another, when he responded, he was the first one to respond to the Pazzi conspiracy. His first condota was, get, con, uh, condota was given to him by Naples, Florence, and Milan in 1467. However, Giovanni always had a condotto with Milan from 1471 all the way up to 1494 and always kept 100 men at arms in Bologna in preparation for being called into any sort of military service. And then he was captured during the Roman Yule Wars, which was an interesting event that um, is a little too deep for this, <laughs> for this lecture. So let's move on. Uh, oh, Fiore, what are you doing here again? We weren't. We definitely weren't. Yeah. All right. So, Annabali II and Hermes Bentivoglio, again, on account of Giovanni's closeness with, uh, with uh, Ercole di Este, spent a considerable time in Ferrar with Ercole di Este and his son Alfonso. The di Este library was home to not one, not two, but three copies of Fiori's works, with each the Getty, the Morgan, and the Paris showing up in catalogs of their inventory made between 1436 and 1467. As a matter of fact, in the time that Annabali Bentivoglio was courting uh, Lucrezia di Este, Annabali was a courtier of the di Este court. So that means that not only was he trying to bang uh, Ercole's daughter, but he was also there training with their knights. As a matter of fact, he took part in a tournament with Ercole di Este and um, uh, Giovanni San Severino, uh, which he was the most famous knight of the day. So, and then later, uh, uh, this should be uh, Hermes trained under Ercole di Este in years leading up to 1492, when he was officially knighted by Ercole di Este. So he trained as a knight in Ferrara and then eventually was knighted by the Duke. So you might be asking yourself, oh, Vadi, what are you doing here? Right, yeah, well, thank you, Vadi. You, you proved my point, right? Yeah, we didn't forget about you, don't worry. So you might be asking yourself, were they still using Fiore in 1492? Were they still using Fiore in 1478? And the answer is Filippo Vadi. Moving on. Until the year 1488, Giovanni II Bentivoglio saw himself as safe in Bologna. He always traveled, traveled with a retinue of 200 loyal followers as an act of precedence, given his family's history, right? No nonsense. But he never really saw himself as under any real threat of danger. He had become a knight, a prince of the Holy Roman Empire. He was actually given the title of prince of the Holy Roman Empire. This is crazy. And given the right to quarter the Bentivoglio coat of arms with the imperial eagle. A member of the house, he also became a member of the House of Aragon. So he starts getting all these royal titles um, bequeathed upon him. His wealth was innumerable, capitalizing on seized assets of exiled families, taxes, le levies, and the Dazio della Carticelle, uh, which gave him a portion of every contract negotiated in the city. He was a friend of dukes, princes, emperors, and popes. He was the political heartbeat of, B of uh, Bologna, and the whole government coalesced around him. He was also much beloved, often catching flack for giving preference to the needs of the common man over those of his own station. 
It was one of those instances that dropped the veil of his supremacy in 1488. Girolamo Malvezzi, son of Battista Malvezzi, tried to break up a dispute between a local shopkeeper and a young stranger in the street. The quarrel came to blows and Girolamo was wounded in his attempt to break up the fight. When the incident was brought before Giovanni, he took the side of the shopkeep and enraged the Malvezzi. Tensions were already high with the Malvezzi at this point just because they were trying to build themselves up as the second family in Bologna. And sometimes when you're the second family in Bologna, you need to challenge the first family. At first, they tried to reach out to Lorenzo de' Medici because he was estranged with Giovanni, because they wanted to get revenge. Um, sorry, sped through that. Uh, yeah. So the four brothers, the four Malvezzi brothers, Girolamo, Giovanni, Filippo, and Ludovico, ended up vowing revenge, vengeance on uh, on Giovanni Bentvoglio. At first, they tried to reach out to Lorenzo de' Medici because he was estranged from Giovanni. Uh, after the affairs in the Romagna where Giovanni was captured, it's a very messy political situation. Uh, that didn't work in their favor, so they turned to the Bolognese underworld. The brothers made contact with a skinner named Battista Zanetti, who hated the Bentvoglio. He knew a guy, an archer, and Bentavoglio's personal guard. And for a tidy sum of 3,000 ducats on the evening of November 27th, the archer let them into the Bentavoglio Palazzo so they could kill Giovanni in his sleep. The assassins were met in the st would meet in the stables opposite of Gian San Giacomo, where Bartolomeo Malvesi had guaranteed them safe refuge. The plan was in motion when one of the co-conspirators, Cristoforo de Parma, reached out to his friend, Ginofo de Bianchi, to see if he could lend him a queers. Ginofo was instantly suspicious, thinking the young man had found himself in some trouble. He asked Cristoforo why he needed a queers, and the young man responded that he was helping Giovanni Malavezzi with an important enterprise. This set off alarm bells in Genofo's mind. He lent Cristoforo the queers and immediately made his way to the Bentavoglio Palazzo, where he demanded to see Giovanni, who was sleeping. The guards woke Giovanni, and Genofo told him about his suspicions. Giovanni Bentavoglio called an emergency meeting of the Sedici, and they interrogated Giovanni Malvezzi, who confessed to the conspiracy. Giovanni Bentavoglio was heartbroken. Not only were his ancestral allies, the Malvezzi, his own blood relatives, and implicated in a plot to murder him, they also confessed that Agamemnon Merescati, the son of Galeazzo Merescati, had agreed to hold 25 men in the palazzo so when word of Giovanni's death reached them, they could secure the Palazzo del Camio. Giovanni felt like he had no one left to trust. For 40 years, the Bentavoglio had been safe from revolution. Giovanni Malvezzi and Giocarmo uh, Bargel Bargelia Barlini, along with 18 others, were executed in the courtyard of the Palazzo of the Podesta. Ludovico tried to escape and was dismembered by a mob of angry Bolognese citizens, while his brothers Girolamo and Filippo, along with their cousins Giulio and Giovanni Battista Refrigero, uh, <laughs> managed to escape. Giovanni Bentavoglio stayed in the Palazzo del Commune for seven days, neither sleeping nor eating. When he reemerged, the beloved ruler of the people had changed. Giovanni had become a tyrant. He unleashed his soldiers on the city on December 4th from the steps of the Palazzo del Commune. He begged the crowd to aid him in ridding the city of this cursed band of traitors. All that was required for justice was a pointed finger and the words, He's with the Mazzi. At about this time, Achille Marazzo was born, and San Gio Giovanni and Prosciutto. In 1485, Guido Rangoni was likely born, and Bologna, not his ancestral home in, in Spilumberto and Odena. His father, Niccolo Rangoni, the captain general of Bologna, and his mother, Bianca Bentavoglio, the daughter of Giovanni II Bentavoglio, are seen here with baby Guido. Isn't he cute? In the arms of the Madonna. The Malvezzi conspiracy was snuffed out in 1488, and the family is banished from the city of Bologna. In 1494 and 1495, Charles VIII invades Italy and is eventually defeated at the Battle of Fornovo, where Annibale Bolio would distinguish himself in the service of Francesco Gonzaga and returns home triumphant. It's an important thing to remember here. 
Here's a nice image of the Battle of uh, Fornovo, where Annabale served in the third line of the men at arms. You can see up in the top left corner, that's Francesco Gonzaga. When Annabale got back, he had been out. He had been on campaign. He had just won tons of fame as a soldier of fortune. He was in hot demand. He was a condottieri now. So what do you do? Well, Annabale Bentivoglio has a building construction which he deemed il casino. It was built for his pleasure and that of his friends so that they could practice with weapons, the arme, and exercise and do similar things from Gerardaki. They look at that. So, Guido Antonio de Luca. The name Guido Antonio de Luca first appears in Bologna in the census conducted in 1496. His residence is in Via Saragossa, under the parish of Santa Maria della Muratelli. According to Murato, and this is hence the last slide, de Luca had more students than warriors that emerged from the belly of the Trojan horse. Jacobo Kelly, who is not always a reliable source, specifically mentions that Guido Antonio de Luca as being under the protection of the Bentolio. He wrote a fencing treatise, now lost, called the Opera Schermo, and then died in 1514, the same year that eventually uh, Giovanni Filotillo Chiellini would publish Viridario, perhaps as an epitaph. Then the turn of the century brought a new threat, and even more anxiety for Giovanni Bentibolio. For the first time, Giovanni was facing the armies of a pope with no allies. The Medici were no longer supreme in Florence, and the Sforza had been removed from power in Milan. Even his old alliances in the Romagna had been destroyed by the new dukedom, being carved out by the ambitious ex-cardinal and son of a pope, Alexander the uh, Alexander the Sixth, Cesare Borgia. To save himself from Borgia's advances, Giovanni Bentivoglio made a calculated alliance and paid Louis XII 43,000 ducats for protection, despite the fact that he had turned down Charles VIII's advance during his invasion of Italy and actively worked to subvert French ambitions. Quickly before moving on, another fantastic resemblance. Am I right? talk about the Mariscotti massacre. Factionally alienated and now politically alienated, Giovanni Bentivoglio's worst nightmare came to pass on Cesare Borgia's second attempt to take the city of Bologna. The papal delegate in Bologna, an, in an inconsistent friend of Cesare, Paolo Orsini, shared a correspondence between Borgia and Giassone and Agamemnon Mariscati. In it was a detailed plot where, Mer where the Mariscati brothers, sons of the great Galeazzo, would overthrow Giovanni and open the gates to Cesare so that he could reign supreme over Bologna. At first, Giovanni suspected the letter to be forged, but he realized that he couldn't take any risks, so he had all the Mariscati, Agamemnon, Giassone, Agesileo, and Ludovico arrested and imprisoned. Giovanni was content to wait. He knew the cunning character of Cesare Borgia and didn't want to act without due process. However, Ginevra Sforza Bentivoglio, the wife of first Santi and now Giovanni II, had different plans. She sent their, their son, Hermes, along with several signs of other members of the Sedici to the Camera del Paradiso on the night of May 3rd, 1501, where they brutally cut all, all four Mariscati brothers to pieces like dogs. The next day, Hermes and his brigands hunted down two more Mariscati who had fled to their country estate and massacred them. Agamemnon's son-in-law was killed in his bed in front of his wife and young children, and another of his brothers was cut down in the street a few nights later. Giovanni, at this time, addressed the Sedici, saying, this will be my ruin. Yet no punishment for the violence followed. I feel a tear myself. I feel a tear myself. I feel a tear. Sorry. Giovanni Filotillo Chiellini. So Giovanni's brother Alessandro was the same age as Annabelle II Bentivoglio, and is likely, it's likely that the boys grew up together. Uh, both Giovanni and his brother Alessandro attended the University of uh, 
Bologna, and both of them got doctorates. His brother would go on to become a famous professor of philosophy and medicine at the university. In 1504, Giovanni finished writing Veradario, a po poem using fantastic allegories to exemplify the arts and artists of Bologna. One of the primary sections of the book is about sword and buckler fencing. And he mentions the grandson of Giovanni II Pentavoglio, Guido Rangoni. He describes a young 19-year-old Guido Rangoni and Viera Dario thus, how an indelicate acts they are, his youth has no equal life, happy and here engulfed in sweet anguish. Now I affirm his virtue. Also in 1504, he worked with Niccolo di Aristotele de Rossi, Manciolino's eventual publisher on the works of Serafino Aquilano. Then Pope Julius happened. With the rise of Julius II as Pope came new trouble for Giovanni Bentivoglio. Julius believed that Giovanni had no legitimate sanction for his power of Bologna and saw Giovanni's will to conduct his own foreign policy as a violation of the church's authority over the city and a threat to the integrity of the papal states. The relationship wasn't made any easier by the two's checkered history the two's checkered history with one another. It started in their youths when Giovanni was a young lord and Julius, then a cardinal in Bologna, found each other's company disagreeable. Their feud was rekindled in 1504 uh, when, uh, upon taking St. Peter's throne, Julius reprimanded Giovanni in 1504 uh, for letting his sons be hired as condottieri when they should be at the disposal of the Holy See, according to Julius, to which Giovanni replied that his sons were young and practiced in arms, and that they shouldn't, they couldn't stay in Bologna without some sort of provision, and that he could not prevent them from trying to get them. I mean, they gotta get some money, am I right? The tumult came to a head when Julius requested a personal audience with Giovanni and the members of the Sedici in Rome, or a hostage guarantee of his four sons, while the Curia, visited Bologna to renegotiate the polit politics, uh, the political structure of the Bolognese government. Giovanni wanted to hold on to power longer, and so Julius used the money he had taken from Cesare Borgia and hired an army to conquer Perugia and Bologna. On November 2nd, 1506, a French army under Chaumont arrived north of Bologna. Giovanni thought this might might be a symbol of his retribution and protection against the Pope, but instead the French batteries opened fire on the city and the Bentevaleschi started to panic. Giovanni's reign had come to an end. Pope Julius II triumphantly rode into the city days later, casting coins with his effigy, styled as Caesar, to the crowds of the weary Bolognese. Julius's conquest would mark the end of Bentivoglio Regency in Bologna, and for many, the sight of the towers disappearing in the distance as their sad caravan exited the city through St. Felix's Gate would be their last. Giovanni died in captivity in Milan, and his wife, Geneva Sforza Bentivoglio, sold all of her possessions trying to will her sons in one last attempt at conquest, leaving her destitute in her remaining years. She was buried in a pauper's grave. With Julius came the Bolognese exiles, members of the Fantuzzi, Canatoli, Mariscati, Malvezzi, Zambacari, Peppoli, Giselieri, De Vazzano, and De Car Car Correggio. The Bentivoglio were gone, but the symbol of their legacy still remained. The magnificent Palazzo Bentivoglio. They took turns smashing down the pillars, then knocking down the walls, before eventually deciding to burn it to the ground. If you ever wondered why Darty's treatise is lost, what happened to De Luca's opera Schermo, here's your likely answer. This wasn't the end for our dear friend, Giovanni Filotillo Chiellini. Chiellini's, Chiellini's brother, Alessandro, fled Bologna in 1506 with the Bentivoglio. He ended up going up to Padua. According to the university's website, Alessandro and likely Giovanni were both courtiers of the Bentivoglio family. Giovanni Filotillo e Chiellini would eventually publish Fiera Dario in 1514, same year as the death of Guido Antonio de Luca. He would go on to serve diligently in the municipal government as a member of the Anziani in the years 1513, 1516, 1522, and 1524. Then he would reach the highest civilian office in Bologna in 1527 when he became Gonfaloniere de Popolo. 
and would conclude his political career in 1537, serving one last term as a member of the Anziani. Another famous statement and relative of the Bentivoglio was Guido Rangoni. He served first as a, a captain in Venice, um, served Venice first as a captain, Captain of, of Stradiotti, and more important, uh, more notably, I guess, crossbowmen on horseback, and then eventually Stradiotti. Um, but having distinguished himself, he started commanding lances and men at arms. Notable battles that he fought in Venetian service were the Siege of Padua and the Battle of La Mota. Um, in 1516, he fought a duel with Ugo Peppoli, who, another Bolognese citizen, they both had a disagreement, said a few words to one another, and then decided that they were going to try to kill each other in a duel course they didn't but and whether or not Guido won the duel is up for debate then he moved on to the service of Leo X Giovanni della Bandineri and Escanio della Corno uh, both serve under his banners both very famous um, possibly been to our um, Bolognese fencing adjacent characters there then he became a captain general of the papal forces against Charles V under Clement VII and because of his inaction is perhaps the most responsible patron for the sack of Rome. Talk about Antonio Francesco Manciolino. So Manciolino attempted to publish first in 1519 under Stefano Guillory, a print run of 1,000 copies. Then he published in 1531 with Niccolò di Aristotele de Rossi in Venice and dedicated his treatise to the late Don Luis Fernandez de Cordova, Duke of Sesa, and papal ambassador for Charles V to Adrian VI. There is one regard in which fencing is similar to medicine. Medicine starts where philosophy ends, just as fencing begins where jurisprudence ends. This is Manciolino arguing about the incorporation of dueling law and fencing treatises. An interesting note here, because we have to ask ourselves, what are these authors what, how do they perceive their art, right? So here it could be Manciolino talking about dueling. But then again, later on in his Cape 2v2 section, he mentions that these techniques were being used in a mortal endeavor in his Sword and Cape 2v2 section, where he says, be, there, be this an assault or actual combat, place yourself and your companion against two adversaries, and then follows through with the play. His book six introduction, he gives a clear insight of how he feels about the utilization of these techniques, arguing that training with blunt weapons is perfectly fine substitute for sharp weapons and that it's not going to change your technique and that doing so doesn't depreciate the effectiveness of the techniques themselves. So here we have this, this is a treatise meant for the cell, but we also have these sharp weapon sections and we have dull weapon sections and that we have Manciolino telling us we shouldn't train with sharp weapons, that we should always train with dull weapons and that it's not going to affect our techniques interesting then we have Achille Morazzo Achille Morazzo was born in San Giovanni in Porchetto his father was Ludovico Morazzo he trained under Guido Antonio de Luca in Bologna along with Guido Rangoni sometime between 1494 and 1506 he started a fencing school in Bologna later on near the Abbey of Saint Nabore and Felice in 1531, Morazzo was able to purchase a mill in the Reno River, a sizable investment. I mean, he had to have some money that had a potential to even elevate his social status, as we've learned about the Guild of Bologna. Then he published his Opera Nova in 1536, a few print runs. It was edited by his son, Sebastiano, who his, the book was originally written for, and reprinted in 1568. He styles himself as Maestro Generale de l'Arte dell'Arme, the Master General of the Art of Arms. Marazzo then died in 1553, and he's buried in Bologna in a military hospital, showing that he was a veteran of Bolognese military service. So, in conclusion, what is Bolognese fencing? More importantly, let's go back to our original question. Who was it meant for? What was the context? And how was it used? Bolognese fencing, or perhaps more appropriately to Valeschi fencing, was meant foremost for Anton Galeazzo, Ercole, Annabale, Santi, Ercole II, Giovanni II, Annabale II, Hermes, or Alessandro. It was also used by their knights, of which each signore was given the right to create 20, and then by their men-at-arms and their courtiers, who we know trained with them because of Ghiridaki and Achiellini. 
it was their the art of their children and their grandchildren like guido rangone and members of the sedici like later patrons um like the later patrons like emilio Mariscotti, who was Murazzo's student emilio malvezzi who vigiani writes about in a later version of his treatise printed by zicara cavacabo the father of girolamo cavacabo and fabio peppoli who is the honor of uh and Fabio Poli, who has the honor of the dedication of Giovanni D'Alagocchi's treatise. So what is Bolognese fencing? It's a system of self-defense built on the perils of the complex civic structure of a city who built its government with a hope of fostering a republic, but instead saw its mechanisms of government used to sire oligarchs, then despots, and eventually a tyrant. As all the authors remind us, this system of civil defense also has its merits in the realm of warfare. But the fact that they have to frame this argument shows us the true underlying nature of its creation. Whether its roots found purchase in the care of Filippo Bartolomeo Dardi or Guido Antonio de Luca, it's clear from the dynamism of this violent history that it was born of a sense of fear, necessity, and suspicion of a desire to live in a world of hidden knives, daggers, and swords, all driven by the thrust of ambition. For some of you, this will inspire you to want to stab the bravos who proclaim and practice the Bolognese arts. Or for others, some of the, these stories will empower the sprezzatura and confidence to exercise your art in the manner of a true Renaissance courtier destined for a street fight. So go forth with this knowledge and emotion, have fun this weekend, and cut each other down. That's it. That was cool, man. That was really good. Thanks. That is intense. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, yeah, if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, um, so it was really interesting to me learning about the special privileges the butchers enjoyed with regards to carrying knives. Do we do we have any information on how far this right was like stretched or extended? Like, was it for butchers knives only or like things bordering on being one handed swords? So I think it was primarily just that could carry knives. So because they had like knives were part of their guild activity, they they could naturally, you know, they probably use that as a guise to say, well, we should be allowed to carry a knife through a city. I shouldn't have to leave my knife at the shop where it could get stolen or something like that, you know? And so um, it's actually really interesting because like um, where we have that instance where um, uh, Cristoforo is borrowing a queerist and the the, the guy that he's borrowing it from is like suspicious. And he's like, why are you borrowing a queerist? That's weird, right? There are actually mentions of, uh, there was a uh, like a local police force that worked for the Podesta, which is like the police chief in the city. And they would walk around and they would actually knock on people's chest to see if they were wearing a breastplate because wearing a breastplate in the city of Bologna was illegal because if you were wearing a breastplate, then you were assuming you were going to get stabbed and therefore you were up to no good. And also like carrying things like bucklers, shields, um, were all illegal. Uh, early on, it's it's also really fascinating because in like the 1200s, carrying a two-handed sword was perfectly fine up until about 1350 when they started to change that law. So it's crazy how these laws kind of change and especially, um, you know, it's once the Bentivolios start to get into power, uh, how they kind of manipulate laws to work in their favor. Yeah, thanks. Really great answer. Yeah. You have a question, Mandy? Uh, yeah, more of just a passing question. I noticed that the title of this PowerPoint is History of Bolognese Fencing Part One. Do you have a part two in the catalog? <laughs> oh, I actually created this, uh, most of the slides I made when I was at work, um, which is the best work that I've ever done in my life. <laughs> just getting paid to do something that I really had fun doing. <laughs> but um, I got the file to be so big that uh, I couldn't email it to myself. And then because I work at a hospital, I wasn't allowed to use my, uh, I couldn't use a flash drive. And, and so I had to break it up in multiple parts to email it to myself. Oh, <laughs> so okay. That's why. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yep. Cool. Any other questions? Well, thanks when is this, uh, to everybody. When is this I really... delivered at Queen's Gambit? Is this Saturday? Um, Friday, Friday night. Okay. Yeah. Friday. Yeah. Are you going to be there? Uh, probably not Friday night, but maybe. Okay. Okay. Yep. 
Well, I'll see you there regardless. Yeah. Look forward to it. Yeah. Thanks for running this. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, everybody.